The Israeli Prime Minister is allowing members of Parliament to visit Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Is he about to change the status quo that governs this holy site? And how much of this is internal politics? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Jane Dutton. It is the most contentious site in the occupied territory. Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, known to Jews as Temple Mount. Two Israeli politicians visited the holy site on Tuesday for the first time in two years. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu allowed it as a test case for future visits. That's despite a ban put on by his own government in 2015 that prevents Israeli politicians from visiting the sensitive site. Al-Aqsa has been the center of recent protests and violence after Israel installed then removed metal detectors after the shooting of two policemen. We have a lot to get to with our guests, but first this report from Harry Fawcett. The ban on Israeli members of the Knesset entering the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, known as the Temple Mount to Jews, has been in place for some 18 months. It was imposed during a period of violence, which itself had sprung up in the wake of a lot of politicized activity in and around the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Israeli ministers, members of the Knesset, had been entering, had been calling for more Israeli sovereignty uh, over the area and, and over the site. And so this was seen as a way of trying to quell some of the, the violence which had sprung up in reaction to that. On July 23rd, it was supposed to have been suspended on a trial basis, at least with members allowed back in. That, of course, was delayed again because of what took place just a few days before. There was an attack just outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque entrance uh, with two Israeli security forces members being killed, the imposition of metal detectors by the Israelis, and then the huge scenes of street protest and prayer that we saw for weeks after that, resulting in the taking down of those metal detectors. Now, we've spoken to the director of the mosque from the Islamic Waqf Authority, which runs it. He says that this was a political act by the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, one which is provocative, especially in the run-up to the Muslim Eid al-Adha festival. We wait to see how more widely the Palestinian population here in East Jerusalem interprets this, just weeks after they were on the streets pro protesting in such vehement style. The status quo that governs the Al-Aqsa compound was established in 1967. That's when Israel and Jordan decided the Islamic Trust, known as Waqif, would control matters inside Al-Aqsa. Recently, several Israeli right-wing movements have been challenging the ban on Jews worshipping at the compound. Some of these Jewish groups also say they want to build the third temple on the site, which is sacred to both Muslims and Jews. And let's bring in our guests in Tel Aviv, Akiva Elder, senior columnist at Al Monitor, in Ramallah, Hassan Khatib, former spokesman for the Palestinian Authority, and in West Jerusalem, Robbie Sable. He's a former legal advisor at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right, let's get straight on to this topic. Robbie Sable, why has the Israeli Prime Minister allowed members of the parliament to visit the Al Aqsa Mosque now? It's important to bear in mind that nobody is visiting the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The mosque is a very small part of the compound. It's a Muslim holy site, and people visit it only with the permission of the imam or the head of the mosque. We're talking about the compound, which is a much, much larger area than the mosque. For over 60 years, people, including Jews, have been allowed to visit, and the, the prime minister is allowing Members of Parliament. He, by yes, the way, okay, but he's that's new. So why, why has he changed his mind as far as the ministers of Parliament are concerned? And is this for one day only? On the contrary, ministers he's still not allowing. By the way, he's under pressure from ministers. Why not allow them? After all, it's strange. Christians and Muslims can visit it, and he's forbidding his ministers from from visiting it because it could cause uh, unrest there. However, members of the public, including members of the parliament, are allowed to visit it. The, the site, again, not the mosque. Exa All right. Hassan Khatib, I mean, this is quite clearly a change of direction. What is your response to what we've seen happen and what do you think the, the message is here? 
Well, um, what happened is uh, a provocation to the Palestinians. What happened is a resumption of the Israeli uh, ongoing attempts to make changes in the status quo in Al Haram al Sharif, uh, which is uh, an Islamic holy place. And uh, there has been uh, understandings between Israel, Jordan, and Palestine that the status quo there should not be changed. Whenever Israel uh, uh, attempt a step uh, that is perceived as a change in the status quo, uh, it provokes uh, the uh, uh, Muslims uh, in Jerusalem and around, and it brings about uh, some tension and sometimes confrontations. But apparently, due to the result that Israel, including the cabinet and the Knesset, is becoming more and more right-wing and more and more uh, religious fanatic, uh, then we have been in the last uh, few years uh, witnessing an increase in uh, these Israeli attempts uh, to provoke Muslims in this holy place. Akiva Elder, where do you stand on this? Do you agree with Robbie Sable that this isn't a change of policy, that this isn't anything new? Or, as Hassan Khatib said, it's an act of provocation? <laughs> Well, I think that uh, it's uh, worth looking at it in a broader uh, perspective because uh, the lack of trust between the Israelis and the Palestinians, as well as between the Israelis and the Jordanian, as well as the, the lack of serious American administration that can go between and can bridge between the sides. So the wounds are still open, and uh, there is no mechanism that can help to at least maintain the uh, situation, to make sure that we don't rock the boat. Because there is no serious peace process, and there is no real hope that things will change, so every little move, every uh, touch of the status quo, looks like a monster. And uh, because the prime minister is not able to pick up the phone and call the king of Jordan and ask him to call the waqf and to make sure that uh, he is on top of things and things are under control, uh, I am very worried. And uh, once, you know, the prime minister what are you is worried hugging about? an Israeli bodyguard, who, I, I'm worried that... Uh, somebody like Hassan just mentioned from the ultra-radical right will uh, decide that this is a good time to provoke the Palestinians and score some points in his constituency and to grab some headlines, I think that it can, we can lose control and it can deteriorate to more violence. Robbie, what's your response to that? I'm afraid, frankly, that we're going to see this from the other side. We do see radical Islamic leaders using this as a rallying point. Al-Aqsa is in danger when there's no danger. People visiting it is not a danger. They're not, not in the mosque. And I'm afraid, and I agree here with Akiva, that this may be used as, a, as, a, as an attempt to spark a confrontation which is not in the interest of Israel or the Palestinians nor Jordan. And I, again, I agree with Akiva. We need to try and calm things down. All right. If the radical, hardcore, right-wing, whatever you want to call them, are behind this and, and instigating further action is expected, what do you think they want? I mean, is this a political uh, stub or a gesture towards Benjamin Netanyahu, considering the looming elections? I think we will likely to see extremists on both sides trying to take advantage of this. In other words, using it from the Islamic side as a rallying point and saying the Jews have tried to take over. Again, I'm sure we're likely to see uh, extremists from the Israeli side wanting to make a point. Hey, this is Israeli sovereignty. We should be there. And it's the duty of the leaders of the Palestinians, of the Israelis and Jordanians, and I hope the Americans as well, to calm things down. Hassan, what role do you think the uh, Palestinian troublemakers would have here? Are they using this for their gain, as Robbie is suggesting, or is there something else happening here? It's not rational uh, to look into the two sides uh, in, in the same way. 
it's useful uh, at this point of the discussion uh, to set the records uh, uh, clearer. Uh, uh, this compound, uh, this Al-Haram al-Sharif, uh, is part of East Jerusalem that is uh, currently under the illegal Israeli occupation, uh, as much as the rest of the West Bank is under the illegal Israeli occupation. And uh, Palestinians are worried that Israel is taking advantage of its control, its illegal control in these occupied territories in order to uh, fulfill certain religious and right-wing agendas. Uh, the problem uh, in Israel now is that uh, the, the extremists are not a uh, uh, minority. They are calling the shots in the Israeli cabinet and in the Israeli Knesset. And I think that the prime minister uh, had to uh, give this gesture uh, because the right wing and the, and the Jewish fanatic uh, uh, leaders are so powerful uh, uh, in the Knesset and in the cabinet to the extent that they are imposing their agenda uh, on the uh, mainstream in Israel in a way that is bringing about more and more frequently uh, tension and confrontations with the Palestinians who seem to be continuing to insist to prevent as much as possible uh, changes in these areas uh, as long uh, 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 in addition to trying to resist changes in the rest of the occupied territories like the settlement expansion that is happening also uh, uh, in pursuant of the same uh, right-wing occupational illegal agenda. And of course I mean you have settlers in Parliament as well don't you Akiva do you think that Benjamin Netanyahu is feeling the growing pressure of the right wing of those who want more changes when it comes to the Palestinians? And is he weakened at the moment? His popularity is, is not good, is it, if I can put it that way? Yes, uh, Jane, first of all, I want to remind you that uh, we uh, have a senior member of the cabinet who goes home uh, from Tel Aviv every day to a settlement. Mr. That's what Lieberman I was referring is a to, settler. Yes. So it's not just in the Knesset. <laughs> yes. Um, now, to, to your question, you know that uh, the name Netanyahu appears more and more in the headlines as a person who is involved in corruption, in scandals, that he spends time with, uh, the, with the police, and uh, that he will probably will not end his term uh, in 2019 with the elections due in March 2019. So uh, there is uh, no wonder that he is getting more and more nervous about his popularity, about trying to divert the, the attention from problems at home, from domestic problems, and going to, for instance, to Russia to talk to Putin again about the uh, Iranian threat, the nuclear threat. Um, he may be, some people even would uh, guess or would be worried that uh, he will be more trigger happy in order to, as I said before, to keep the media, the agenda uh, somewhere else, not with his candles. And uh, uh, while everybody is expecting the elections to happen early next year, of course, there, there is a race between in the Likud and between the Likud and Bennett and the more radical parties uh, to uh, try and grab as many support from the settlers who are very strong in the central committees and pondering more and more to the right. Hassan, from a Palestinian point of view, all of those that Akiva mentioned in the race are not particularly appealing to Palestinians, are they? Uh, they're not appealing, but uh, I, I, I also uh, want to add that uh, Israel that we are talking about and uh, 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 watching is no longer uh, Israel that we uh, dealt with and negotiated with 20 and 25 years ago. Uh, in Israel now, um, there, is, there is no critical mass uh, of people, neither among the public nor in the political elite, whom are willing uh, to go for peaceful arrangements on the basis of ending uh, the Israeli occupation 
uh, on uh, the occupied uh, Palestinian territories. This Israeli cabinet can only agree on uh, uh, steps regarding uh, further consolidation of this, of this illegal occupation in Palestinian territories, including and especially in Jerusalem and including in a uh, holy side uh, such Al-Haram Sharif. Therefore, uh, this new nature of Israel is on one hand preventing the possibility of uh, the resumption of any meaningful peace process and on the other hand is preparing the ground for uh, further future tension and further possible confrontations, especially that uh, uh, this nature of Israel is instigating also extremism uh, in the Palestinian side. Robbie, what's your response to that? And does this effectively quash any ideas of a resumption of the peace process? Two points I'd like to make. This is not a Netanyahu issue. It's an issue which would be true for any Israeli government. Are Jews allowed to visit an area that is holy for many Jews they respect? It. And they have in the past, and they're being denied it now. This is the issue. I don't think it's an yeah, issue. Yeah, but what is... Pushing is the status quo, isn't he? I mean, it, it was agreed, signed and steel, sealed, even though there is no paperwork. And what he is doing, his critics say, is pushing that envelope, pushing the status quo. And everybody knows that that is provocative. On the contrary, the status quo was that people, Jews, could visit it. This was denied, and now they're renewing it. In fact, uh, Netanyahu has gone beyond that and not allowing his cabinet ministers to visit it. But the status quo was every Jew could visit it. I visited it frequently. I'm sure others have visited it. The second issue is I, I respect deeply Hassan, but I wish we could hear some condemnation of extremism from the other side. All we heard was condemnation of, of Israelis. No condemnation of the fanaticism we're seeing from some of the Islamic leaders who are frankly pouring oil on the fire instead of trying to calm things down. And I really wish I could hear this instead of hearing condemnation of Israelis. And the final point is, I'm not sure the Palestinians are on the stage where they're willing to make the difficult decisions that have to be taken by the two of us, by Israelis and Palestinians, to agree on a border. Very difficult decisions. I w hope I'm wrong, but I don't see from the Palestinians the decision, the ability at this okay, stage... OK, I'm going to let Hassan uh, answer those questions that you put to them. But where does this lead the, the Palestinians? You're seeing Israelis move into East Jerusalem, snapping up homes there. We've seen a doubling of illegal settlements under Betterman Netanyahu. I mean, all of these issues are, are hot potatoes, are sacrosanct when it comes to the peace negotiations. So I'm just wondering where this leaves the Palestinians, and what is it that you're offering them to play with? It was interesting to see a stable Palestinian state, which is really policy to do so. But for this, we have to agree on difficult issues, including Jerusalem. And it's a difficult decision. I don't see Palestinian willingness. I, I, we have in the past, I've negotiated with them. I hope in the future, I or my successors will be able to negotiate with them. But they have to sit down and make very difficult decisions. And condemning Israel is not, not the way to reach an agreement. Hassan? Uh, I, I'm not happy with extremism anywhere, but uh, I blame extremism in Palestine on the occupation. I think that uh, uh, this ongoing uh, uh, violence between Israelis and Palestinians is happening within the context of the illegal Israeli occupation. And as long as there is occupation, especially that it is a very violent occupation, uh, it's uh, whether we like it or not, there will have to be uh, 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 extremism and uh, all kinds of reactions from the Palestinian side. I believe that there is only one way to end extremism among Palestinians and probably also among Israelis, which is if Israel would agree to end this Israeli occupation okay, uh, and allow Palestinians to when, live in peace and sorry, dignity I'm and in independence. Was talking, what is it that you wanted to say? Yes, I uh, just want to mention that a few days ago, the chief of staff of, the, of Iran, the Iranian chief of staff, uh, predicted that in 25 years, the Zionist identity will cease to exist. And I think that he's right. And uh, we didn't mention the uh, apartheid regime in the occupied territories. In less than 25 years, the uh, Jews will be the minority between the sea and the Mediterranean. So, there is no status quo. 
we are going backwards. Israel keeps building it looks like more and more units it, it in, looks the, like in the settlements. Uh, the, uh, those areas, those regions, Israel and Palestine, are heading towards a one-state solution at this rate, aren't they? I mean, a two-state solution is, is pretty dead now, isn't it? No, it will not be a... No, Jane, I'm not sure if uh, we will have a one-state solution. But you can't have a two-state solution. How is that possible? Because I don't see the uh, Jewish majority, and I am... Well, maybe a one and a half, you know, Israel and the Palestinian Authority. This is the <laughs> reality right now. And I think that this is, a, you, Jane, you put your finger uh, right on the money because Israel will have to make up its mind. You want a two-state solution or a one-state solution because apartheid cannot really exist uh, for a very long time. Robbie, Jared Kushner has been over... You've got the U.S. jockeying for conclusion here, Donald Trump at the helm. These latest gestures by Netanyahu, I mean, doesn't that undermine Donald Trump's vision for peace then? Will we see peace under Donald Trump? Frankly, I haven't, I haven't heard an articulation of Donald Trump's vision, but let's put that aside. What Americans can do is to help the parties get together. By the way, I would like to add... The word apartheid shouldn't be used. It's a, it's a racial uh, discrimination, which is, that's not the issue here. The issue here is two national groups fighting over the same land and have to agree on a border. It's not an apartheid issue. I hope that phrase is not used. But come back to your question. Yes, the Americans can help. Apartheid is in I the don't occupied see territories. It's not apartheid. It's a problem with two national groups that have to settle it. It's not, it's not a majority uh, who are not allowed to, uh, to vote. That's not the issue here. Uh, well, I think it's the fact the that the issue. Palestinians and the Arabs yeah. will have a, a second-class status yeah. if you were to end up in a one-state uh, solution, that just being one of the, I do, one of the I, issues. I strongly object to a one-state solution. We need two states. We need a Palestinian state living next to us. But for that, we have to agree on a border, and it's very difficult to reach agreement both, on both sides. But uh, that is the only, the only solution. But to come back again to the Americans... Why, I we have the 67 solution. <laughs> well, that, you can propose that. That went through the main road to Jerusalem. It cut through villages in half. I'm not sure. It cut Jerusalem in half. You can propose that. But whether that's the ideal border, I'm Bobby, not sure. Bobby, you know that there is a possibility back. of a territorial swap. All right, I'm going to bring okay. Hassan in very quickly, if that, I may. Uh, Hassan, on the table, we have the idea that, of... Slot, I, I should yeah. imagine, Hassan, from yeah, both sides, I, from the uh, Israeli and the Palestinian if, if, side... If you allow me... The, the, the public needs to see that something is going to move, that something is going to change. And, and possibly the members of parliament visiting the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound is not the key to the sort of change that both sides need. What is it at the moment that, say, that, that people living I'll there say, need to see? Yeah, I, I want to say that the only changing thing, uh, uh, the only dynamics uh, now in the region is the settlement activities. And as long as Israel is allowing this increase in settlement expansion that is illegal in all uh, uh, senses, Israel uh, should not have the ethical right of talking about two-state solution because there is a clear contradiction between the principle uh, the concept of two-state solution and the continuity of settlement expansion. If Israel truly uh, uh, is committed to two-state uh, solution, then the only way to show, to prove their commitment is to preserve the territories that is supposed to be the, the areas of the future Palestinian state for that particular purpose. But as long as they are moving that fast in changing the reality, in settling uh, uh, especially extreme uh, Jewish people illegally in our land uh, and in this uh, uh, crazy manner, then uh, they cannot be at the same time talking about two-state solution. Okay, they and let's leave it there. Hassan Khatib, thank you very much for your time. Akiva Eldar and Robbie Sable. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. Mine is at Jane Dutton. Goodbye from me.